Some of you heard me share last week that we concluded our vacation Bible school series with our young people. And Pastor Tammy and Debbie Shelley and I had a conversation about the fact that the curriculum being taught to the children was incredibly powerful and timely for the fullness of the body. Sometimes we would do well to relearn the basics of faith because it is the simplicity of the love of God that changes us. The Vacation Bible School theme for this year was, I have confidence. I have confidence because I am known and I belong. I have confidence because I am forgiven. I have confidence because I can change. I have confidence because I am called to make a difference. And today I want to begin by asking you to take real inventory of yourselves. Today, are you standing in confidence? 18 months through this pandemic, facing things that we as a collective body have not faced before. 18 months into a pandemic in which all of a sudden things were turned upside down and that which you thought was true was proven to be moved. Do you have confidence? Or has this pandemic eroded within you in some way a belief that God in you is enough, a belief that the church will continue forward by the call of the Spirit, a belief that your family can be whole, a belief that your finances will not forever be compromised. Do you have confidence? It took Vacation Bible School for me to admit that journeying these past 18 months had eroded some of the strength that I thought I had. If you look at Webster's Dictionary, the definition of confidence is the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. It is a firm trust. Well, no wonder when we walk through a collective trauma like what we have walked through, no wonder that there are places in which the firm trust we may have held has been challenged. The second definition from Webster, Webster's Dictionary is that confidence is the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. I was talking with my spiritual director a few weeks ago, and one of the things that she said to me that deeply resonated was that this pandemic has been unprecedented in part because everything, every single one of us has been under mental and emotional and spiritual and financial challenge all at once. And as the body of Christ and as communities that function together, normally when one of us falls down, somebody else is standing in confidence or strength or hope enough to pick them up. But we have all been challenged together. Some of you may know that there was a memorial service yesterday for Jim Davis, a 40-year member of Epworth who died in November of 2020. And in this small memorial gathering where the family could finally be together to grieve the passing of this man who was fundamental to the ministry at Epworth and certainly to their family. After the service, I stepped outside of the outdoor venue and saw a woman standing alone grieving. She shared that her father too had passed and that she felt so frustrated with herself that she couldn't be focused on the family but rather focused on her own grief. And I said to her, it is the place where we stand. It is where we are. Each of us stands in need of the other one, knowing in this very moment that pieces and parts of us have been eroded, and yet I am here to declare to you that we still can have confidence 
when we claim the forgiving grace that God offers. I spoke to this woman and I speak to us that the forgiveness that God offers not only frees us from the slavery to sin and death that comes in our own iniquity, but the context of forgiveness allows you and I to operate in grace. I have confidence today because I don't have to have done it perfect. I have confidence today because I can admit there were places that I could have responded differently, but God walks with me, forgives me, and leads me on. I have confidence. Webster's third definition of confidence says, a feeling of self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. Raise your hand if you've doubted yourself at least once in the last 18 months, right? And so I want you to see, to hear the voice of God saying, I know, I know that you are walking through this together, but the confidence that I invite you to stand in is not just a confidence based on your own self-assurance. It is a confidence based on my character that claims you. Biblicalwordstudy.com suggests that biblical confidence is a multifaceted word that encompasses a range of aspects in Christian belief. Confidence, biblically, is faith in God and certainty and assurance of one's relationship with God. Don't let go. Don't let go of God's hand, even when it doesn't make sense. Stand in the assurance of a God who has given God's life and over and over and over again finds the tree where we are hiding and calls us down. Biblical confidence, it says, is a sense of boldness that is dependent on a realization of one's acceptance by God. What if God shows greater forgiveness and grace to you than you show to yourself? What if we looked back over all that we have learned and experienced over the last 18 months and decided that it was okay to say that we had made some mistakes? Raise your hand if you made some mistakes. If you spoke to somebody in a way that you wish you could take back. If you got angry at someone because you didn't know what else to do with the feelings inside. What if we were to acknowledge that we have come through this pandemic together, that we didn't always know how to carry each other's burdens, we didn't always know the path to follow, we didn't always trust, but by the grace of God, Jesus stands at the bottom of the tree and says, you, Jen, I'm coming to your house for dinner. I'm coming to your house for dinner. The third thing that is contained in biblical confidence is a conviction that one's destiny is secure in God. That the end game, that the final run, that the bigger picture of who we are is held in the hands of God. And there is a confidence that comes from relying on who God is. I want us to look at this Isaiah passage. I think Isaiah is one of the richest prophets that we find in the Old Testament. There is so much contained. Don't lose the fact that Pastor Tammy talked about a sermon series entitled New Beginnings and preached on Isaiah 40 and 41 several weeks back. And today again... God leads us to Isaiah, Isaiah 43, beginning with the 22nd verse. But in order to understand what God is saying, 
I want us to remember that at the beginning of the book of Isaiah, God is speaking to the people of Israel and saying, I am tired of your rote sacrifices. I'm tired of the routine ways that you show up in the temple, that you pay for a blood offering, but your hearts are far from me. I'm tired of your habits of religion that do nothing to move your heart closer to mine. You remember God talking about this? And I wonder if in part we're called to reflect on our faith journey pre-COVID. What was rote and habit and routine? Now hear me when I say this. As your pastor, I actually believe that part of faithfulness is in moments when your heart is struggling to engage with God. There is a habit of discipline, of coming to worship, of reading the Bible, of praying. Even when it doesn't seem to be moving, there is value in that. But God is speaking about a sense that we somehow can hide our hearts from God high up in a sycamore tree and think that God is pleased just with our motions. But in Isaiah 43, God says, I don't want your rote motions, but I don't want you to forget your sin either. I don't want you to act like there is no iniquity, God says. In fact, you do falter. You do need me. You do need to make sacrifice or offering in order to come into right relationship with me. And for us now, that means we need to continually seek the relationship with Jesus the Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who has taken away the sin of the world. But in Isaiah 43, God articulates that sin is heavy. God says, yet Did you not call upon me, O Jacob? But you have been weary of me, O Israel. You've left me behind. You're not even going through the motions anymore. You've not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. It was too hard to log in online, and giving online was more than you wanted, so you just walked away. God says, I've not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense, but you haven't brought me any sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But God says, listen to this, you're still burdening me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Pause for a moment and consider that our sin and our iniquity is wearisome to God, and it is extraordinarily heavy to carry. And if it's wearying and heavy for God, what about for us? And God's hope is right in verse 25. Don't miss this. God says, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. I forgive you because it's what I desire. I blot out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God forgives us because God longs for us to be light enough to be in relationship with God. God goes on. Accuse me, let us go to trial, God says. Set forth your case so that you may be proved right. Your first ancestor sinned and your interpreters transgressed against me. Therefore, I profaned the princes of the sanctuary. I delivered Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. In that moment, there was nothing of sanctuary worship that God was pleased with. But in 44, God says, hear, O Jacob. My servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb and will help you. Do not fear. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing upon your offering. There shall spring up like a green tamarisk willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. The other will be called by the name of Jacob. Another will write on his hands the Lord's and adopt the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. 
God seems to lay out so clearly. I don't want your empty habits, but I don't want you to forget that you need me to redeem you that you cannot make it through without making mistakes, without wandering from me. You need me to call you back again and again. We accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in a first and powerful moment, but as Wesleyans, we believe that there is this process of grace at work in our life where we are sanctified day after day, growing in the perfecting love of God. But in order to be sanctified, we need to acknowledge our sinfulness daily that God would redeem us again and again, and again. I want you to think about this past time. It wasn't until I prepared for this sermon that I started to pay attention to the fact that not only has my confidence been shaken in places, but there are parts of my heart that are bitter. Anybody have a place of bitterness that's formed over the last 18 months? A place where somebody has not been or has not responded like you want. How many political conversations have existed in families that have created rifts so deep that there is non-communication? How many places have differences of opinion about the COVID pandemic and how to respond? How many places has it divided you from people that you loved, from people that you trusted? How many times has your own weariness been taken out on somebody else? And perhaps even more powerful, where are you bitter with yourself? What have you not let go of internally? Where do you continue to punish yourself for what you could have, should have done differently in this time? I have confidence because I am forgiven. But in order to stand in that confidence, I need to accept the invitation of God to change my heart. Literally, to understand the story of Zacchaeus, we need to understand that Zacchaeus, it says, was the chief tax collector in Jericho, meaning that he was the one responsible for paying to Rome a lump sum of money for the taxes for all of the Jews in that area. And once he had paid that money to Rome, Zacchaeus and the rest of the tax collectors had to make their money back off the backs of their own people. And so, of course, it created the possibility for deceit. And tax collectors were known not just for being outcasts because they were poor or they were sick or they were untouchable, but they were outcasts in the community because they were unjust, because they hurt people. And so, Zacchaeus was known as the one who had taken money that did not belong to him in order to make up what he had paid to Rome and then some. And yet somehow he knew that this Jesus made a difference. And when Jesus walked into Jericho, Zacchaeus looked for a way to find a sycamore tree that he could climb up into. I don't think that the gospel has anything against short people. I certainly hope not. Our destiny and I are in trouble, right? <laughs> but I believe that there's something about Zacchaeus being described as short that perhaps points to all of the shortfalls in each one of us. And Zacchaeus tries to climb this tree, and it doesn't... Uh, escape me the fact that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but he doesn't want to be eye to eye with Jesus. And Jesus knows and stands at the bottom of that tree. And perhaps the most amazing thing of all is that Jesus speaks to Zacchaeus undignified up in a tree as a grown man trying to hide out. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry. Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And I want you to pay attention to Zacchaeus' response. Zacchaeus could have run away. We've all done it. 
Zacchaeus could have said, Lord, it's going to take me a few days to get this cleaned up enough for you to come in. Zacchaeus, it says, hurried down the tree and was happy to welcome Jesus. I have confidence because I'm forgiven. He was happy to welcome the forgiveness that Jesus offered. Somehow he knew that his shortcomings might be made more complete by this grace that Jesus offered. And all the rest, the church, of course, everybody's complaining. Jesus is going to be the guest of sinners. Zacchaeus and Jesus pay them all no mind. Zacchaeus, in fact, says to the Lord, look, here are half of my possessions. I'll just give them all to the poor right now. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Do you notice in this scripture that Jesus doesn't enter into a dialogue with Zacchaeus about what is enough restitution, how much should be paid, what would be enough to make up for the sin? Jesus is not interested. Go ahead, make restitution. But he says, today, salvation has come to this house because Zacchaeus, too, is a son of Abraham, because he, too, belongs, because he, too, is part of the community of Israel, because he is one of mine. Salvation has come to this house. And Jesus goes on for anybody who would have more commentary on where he should or shouldn't be. He goes on to say, for the Son of Man came to seek out and to save those who are lost. I have confidence because I know that I get lost and I rest in the grace of God who brings me home. Where are you holding out to receive the forgiveness that God offers? And where are you withholding forgiveness from another? One of the people that I really respect speaking about forgiveness is Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer is really honest and upfront about the fact that her early days included sexual abuse that is never, ever, ever okay. And Joyce Meyer is very clear to identify that forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. Forgiveness is a decision empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit that I make to take the hooks of anger and resentment and poison, is what Joyce Meyer calls it, out of my heart so that I can walk in freedom forward. Reconciliation is when there is a repairing of the relationship. And sometimes reconciliation is a beautiful and important thing, but sometimes reconciliation is dangerous because it's not safe to be in that relationship now just like it wasn't safe before. So Jesus is talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness, letting go of the places that our hearts have become poisoned, and I have done inventory in my heart and declare to you today that part of my ability to walk forward in confidence I now know will be tied to my ability to forgive myself and others and leave behind the heaviness of that iniquity that even God does not want to hold, <laughs> to walk into the future that God has given us. This is an important reality for us. I was reading an article from a teacher, a teacher who was reflecting on what she has learned through COVID-19, and she says, as for acceptance, I'm learning to face the new reality that COVID has created. Regardless of how scary the unforeseen future is, I'm discovering it's okay to feel overwhelmed or anxious or scared of the unknown. Raise your hand if you're scared of the future, right? Because in a way that has not happened collectively across the world, there is an uncertainty of what's going to happen with economies and relationships and institutions. And yet there is God. I have confidence because I'm forgiven. 
I have confidence because I know who holds my destiny. I have confidence because I know he will seek me out in a tree until I allow his saving grace to come over my house. She says, I'm recognizing the importance and necessity of giving myself grace to process all that is happening. You know, not showing grace to ourselves or forgiving ourselves or those closest to us is a desperate attempt to maintain control. Did you know that? It's a desperate attempt to try to punish somebody else or punish ourselves, discipline ourselves in shame into somehow becoming different, and yet that is never the result. And so part of walking with confidence is receiving the forgiveness God gives, offering the forgiveness that God models, and walking forward into an unforeseen future, believing that there is a God who is right beside me the whole way. The teacher concluded by saying, although circumstances look differently, I've learned that my desire to teach and inspire kids has not changed. What that will look like going forward, I don't know, but who I am and what I'm called to be remains the same. When I stand in confidence, knowing that I'm forgiven, I can see the pieces of me that may not be clearly before me, but I believe God will make a way for those to be used in the next movement of God's Spirit. I want to close by talking a little bit about the process of forgiveness. Because I think sometimes we talk about forgiveness, receiving the forgiveness of God and forgiving others, and we really don't have the foggiest idea how to start. If you know that place in your heart that's bitter or resentful or angry right now, ask yourself, what do I need to do next to move forward? Dr. Neil Hallowell talks about, Ned Hallowell, I'm sorry, talks about four steps to forgiveness, and I believe they're valuable to listen to. First, he says, the first step is to acknowledge what happened. Allow yourself to feel whatever you're feeling now about these last 18 months. Where are you frustrated? Who are you angry with? What's clouding your ability to see? And before you judge yourself and say you have no right and everybody's had it worse than you, just, just, just name it. Feel it. Allow it to be there. Talk to someone you trust and open up about how you've been hurt or how you're angry. Let your emotions out. Don't apologize for them, but do it with somebody that you're speaking to. Don't po- impose them on somebody else. We tend to live in a culture, and I don't know if you can feel this, but right now it feels so intense to me. Our culture says, just move forward. Just take the next step. Put your running shoes on and let's go. We're about to be in the new reality. Take inventory of where you've been. Otherwise, you're going to carry all that heavy burden with you into the next place. And once you've had a chance to vent, Dr. Hallowell says, You're ready to appeal to your rational side. This question to me is really powerful. Ask yourself and God, what do you want to turn the pain I feel into? What do you want to do with my anger and my bitterness and my resentment? What do you want to do with the places that I failed, God? What do you want to teach me about myself? What do you want to teach me about your character What do you want to teach me about being in relationship with others? Move from your feelings to your mind. And then look for the hook, the place that you get really close to moving beyond that feeling and something sucks you back. But God, that person, they had no right to. Don't you see? Of course. Forgiveness is never about justifying It's about freeing ourselves by the grace of God to move forward. The third thing Dr. Hallowell says, he says this step is difficult. I think they're all difficult, honestly. (laughs) Analyze your anger and put your life back into perspective. 
My husband is here in worship today. I give thanks to God, and, and he's good at that for me. I'll speak it all. I'll lay it all out there. Everything's just going to be a mess. And he'll say, but what about this? What does that look like in the bigger picture? What does that look like in the long arc of who you are? What does that look like in the bigger plans that God has? Yeah, I feel it. Yeah, I want God to teach me something. And I also want it to be in perspective, a perspective that includes giving thanks for the fact that I'm standing here today. But by the grace of God, we're here today. But by the grace of God, you've made it this far by faith. But by the grace of God, you are still alive. There is something within you that has given you the resilience to move forward. There is a way in which God has walked with you. Do not lose sight of the fact that there is victory in simply standing in today. And fourth, and this is really important, as we deal with anger and bitterness and resentment, learn to renounce your anger and resentment. Remember Jesus when Peter got all crazy on him and Jesus said, Satan, get behind me? The idea of renouncing is declaring in a loud voice, I declare this will not hold me. So when your anger comes back and your bitterness comes back and the resentment comes back, because it will, it is a process of letting go over and over. Dr. Hallowell talks about it as flattening the hook on the fish hook, right? Push that barb down, not with your hand, but with something hard. And when it comes back, push it back down again. <laughs> I renounce anger, resentment, and unforgiveness in my life. Because when I let it lead me, it's too heavy for my heart to carry. Nelson Mandela says, when a deep injury is done to us, we never heal until we forgive. We never can move from this place until we forgive ourselves and whatever else and move forward. Lewis Smead says, forgiving does not erase the bitter past. A healed memory is not a deleted memory. Nobody is asking you to forget what happened. Instead, forgiving what we cannot forget creates a new way to remember. We change the memory of our past into a hope for the future, which is why God reminds us, your sin is always before me. You must come back again and again and again. Salvation is not a one-time yes. It is a journey with a God who's coming to your house for dinner now. Finally, finally, I want us to consider the ways in which living into forgiveness allows us to stand in strength, allows us to claim who we are without having to be perfect, allows us the opportunity to change, allows us the ability to model the broken, holy healing that comes through Jesus Christ. In closing, I want you to consider the place in your own life that you are too heavy to take the next step. The place that you need to ask God to help you name it, to ask that hard question, what do you want to teach me through this pain? What do you want to do with this, God? To put it into perspective and to renounce it every time it comes back again. And who would we be as the body of Christ if we did this again and again and again. I have confidence because I am forgiven. He